Hey guys, Thingfishy here, and welcome to build guide number 18. And for this one, I decided to centre my build around status effects. The goal here was to use all of the most powerful ones to see how much boss bullying they allow for. And for the most part, the answer is quite a lot. There were a couple of roadblocks for me on this run, but don't worry, I'm going to show you how you can make those a whole lot easier. I went for relatively balanced Dex Arcane stats for this run, but I definitely want to do a pure Arcane variant of this build with some different weapons in the future. So to get set up, I followed my standard setup guide, link to the full video and play along in the description, grabbing the Golden Seeds, Sacred Tears and the Sombre Upgrades. And unfortunately, you're going to have to grab the smithing ones as well, as we're using both smithing and somber weapons on this playthrough. So once you've got all that, we pick up the action here at the Shaded Castle in the Outer's Plateau. Ride around to the right side and hop into the castle up this rock and grab the Grace. Then head back out and ride around to the right towards the nearby cliffs. We're here for this NPC, as she drops the weapon that we're going to use for the whole game. Now, obviously fighting her straight up without any levels would be rough. But she's an NPC near some cliffs, so you can probably see where this is going. Lure her to this ledge, where there is only room for one person, and wait for her to roll off. This might take a couple of tries, but it's nothing to worry about grab our main weapon for the game, the Antspur Rapier. One of the few weapons in the game that inflicts Scarlet Rot build-up. And we have some great fashion too. Now before we continue any further, I'd like to thank the sponsor for this video, Clash Royale. Clash Royale comes from the same team behind Clash of Clans, Supercell and it's been around since 2016. Since its launch, it's been continuously updated and improved for a more consistent and fun experience for all of its players. Clash Royale is a card-based online multiplayer strategy game that allows you to play PvP matches in real time across over 20 different awesome arenas you can unlock by acquiring trophies. Win matches and acquire trophies by knocking the enemy king and princesses from their towers. Clash requires a lot of strategy across its three minute PvP matches and each match ends with a frantic crescendo as both you and your opponent launch your final assaults. There are over 100 different cards including all of the fan favourites from Clash of Clans. You can collect troops like giants, minions, dragons, golems, valkyries, witches, and even this little guy who rides around in a little balloon throwing bombs at stuff. He's my favourite. You can also unlock all manner of spells such as earthquake, poison and fireball. And even structures like goblin huts, teslas and bomb towers you can drop into the battlefield. Level up your cards as you go to fit your playstyle and ensure you're best prepared for your next battle. If all this sounds good to you, you can check out Clash Royale for free on Google Play or the Apple App Store by clicking on the link below. Once again, thank you Clash Royale for sponsoring this video. Now head to Lena's Rise in Kaelid and bait the Knight's Cavalry into yeeting himself off. It's been a while since I've mentioned this in a guide, but after seeing some comments recently, no, it's still not patched. Sometimes he will fall off the bridge and survive the fall. When this happens, he'll respawn on the bridge. The method I use for this has been the same for around 15 playthroughs now and has only failed on two of them. I jump on the bridge hit the wall around this point to aggro him, then run to the far end and turn around. As you turn around, he'll usually be jumping at you. For a while, I thought that this was 100% consistent. 
and on the guide where I was actually going to reveal this to you, it failed. But like I said, first try on 13 out of 15 attempts isn't bad. Now head to Fort Farrath and kill Grail with the bleed grease, popping a pickled foul foot as she dies. Now back to the round table and buy all the necessary smithing stones to level the Anspur Rapier to plus 16. Now walk back to the Celia Crystal Tunnel and ride south then east into the swamp to find this little guy chilling on his island. You can't kill him with melee attacks as he just teleports away so grab your bow out and shoot him from a distance for the Poison Mist Ash of War. Now head to Leonia, equip Radagon's Saw Seal and head to the south of the lake and into the Stillwater Cave. To get absolutely bullied by this clean rot knight, take it slow and don't get too greedy with this guy and you'll be fine. We're here for the Wing Sword Talisman. Now, I actually meant to grab the Valkyrie's prosthesis from Millicent later in the game, but I never did, so this one was with me until the end. It's a really solid talisman. Now it's time for Margit. At the Grace, equip the Poison Mist Ash of War to the Rapier for a weapon that applies two status effects, Scarlet Rot and Poison, and equip the Strength and Dex tiers to your Physic. Head into Margit and get stuck in with R1s to start building up those status effects. I went for parries to do this, but plenty of his attacks allow enough room for a couple of R1s. Now, while the game allows you to apply two status effects at the same time, it won't show the animations for both, so sometimes it can be a little tricky to know what's applied and what's not. The poison effect has a relatively slow tick and doesn't do a whole lot of damage. Scarlet Rot, however, is much more noticeable when it procs. Once you have both effects applied, the fight is already over. You can keep attacking to delete that health bar even quicker, or just do what I did and fall around waiting for the Poison and Rot to do its thing. Now for Godric. This is a good opportunity to talk about the Poison Mist Ash of War. It procs poison immediately on a lot of bosses and imbues your weapon with an extra poison effect for a small time. So it's really good to use at the start of most fights. And there's not a lot more to say about this fight. Godric's slow moveset allows you to proc your effects very fast. Now head to Rayo Lucaria for Red Wolf. And he's actually a little tougher than usual, as we're not going to get any effect build-ups on this fight. As always though, capitalise on and punish the jump attacks and you'll be fine. Grab the Stone Sword key in the courtyard and head up to Renala. And I was excited about this one, as we can one cycle her with that poison and rock build up. Spam R1 on the first cycle, and she'll be dead before the second. Wait. Okay, well, she can't die while she's in the air, apparently. Okay, so let's try this again. If you're quick on the first attack, you can actually one cycle her. Drink your Physic on the final hit if you haven't already. For Phase 2, get stuck in with R1s and that health bar will disappear very fast. Now you may have noticed at this point that I've done something uncharacteristic and actually leveled Vigor. And that's because now I want an item that's in Nokron. 
So head into Kaelid and towards Castle Redmayne for the big man. And if you know even the slightest thing about Elden Ring lore, you can probably guess how a Scarlet Rock build is going to do here. I'll let this one play out. Now head back to Limgrave and down into the Greater, into Nokron, and light the Ancestral Woods Grace. Then down into the Night Sacred Ground. We're here for an item that you can find in the building over this bridge, the Black Wet Blade. Head out and light the Grace here for later. Now the reason that we want this item is you can use it to give our poison and rot rapier a bleed affinity. So we can now inflict three status effects all at once. Before we head to Noble, walk back to the church of Ella in Limgrave and buy the torch from Carlo. Then head to the Altus Plateau, ride from the Erdtree Gazing Hill Grace, past the Mariner and towards the Seathwater Terminus until you get to this cave. Head in and all the way through to the Kindred of Rot bosses. The secret to fighting these guys is going for backstabs as they cast pest threats. It does a ton of damage and the iframes from it protect you from the actual attack. Head back to Enya in the round table to grab the third talisman pouch and equip the Kindred of Rot's Exaltation. This talisman boosts your damage when a nearby enemy is poisoned or rotted, so it's the perfect choice for this build. Now head to Volcano Manor and all the way through to Noble. Treat this like any other fast weapon fight and go for parries and R1s whenever you can. The combination of Rot poison and now bleed makes this one a very easy fight. Head through the rest of the dungeon all the way to Rykard. And if you're inquisitive like me, you might be wondering whether a Serpent Hunterless Rykard is an option for this build. And yes, it probably is if you're an absolute god gamer who never gets hit. So I equip the Serpent Hunter in my left hand, the Lance in my right, and spam Crouching Pokes for both phases. Now at this point, I was asking myself one question. What's better than a build that has three status effects? Yeah. So head into Argyle Lake and spam our ones at Argyle. Let him do his funky thing of getting stuck on this ledge for five minutes. Then kill him for a dragon heart. Now go down into the stranded graveyard and into the Fringe Folk Hero's grave. Head right at the bottom and up the ramp to kill this knight for the Dragon Communion Seal. Then back to Celia 
in Caelid and southwest to the Cathedral of Dragon Communion to buy Argyll's Flame and Dragon Ice. Memorise both of these at the Grace. Now back to Volcano Manor, all the way through to the Stone Sword Key Gate, and down to grab the Somber Seven by the Abductor, and finally back to the Church of Pilgrimage in Weeping Peninsula, and down the cliffs to the south to grab the Faith Tear by these flowers. Now back to Altus and across the battlefield to the Draconic Tree Sentinel. Open up with Dragon Ice to get a Frost proc for some extra damage throughout the fight. Then proc Poison with the Ash of War. Then go for parries to proc Scarlet Rot on him. Now head into Lane Dell, and at this point, I'll show you something that I didn't grab until the final boss of this run, but that you might want to grab now if you want to do some pretty ridiculous damage. The Lord of Blood's Exaltation Talisman. The reason that I didn't grab this now was that I've done quite a few guides with this talisman, and I didn't want this to turn into another arcane bleed build with some token poison and rot damage but this would certainly have helped with some of the later, more problematic fights. So grab this now and use it if you need to. Head down through the sewers and into the Lanedale catacombs. If you want to save yourself some pain, hop back to Caelid at this point and ride up to the isolated merchant in Dragon Baron to buy the Beast Repellent Torch. The torch will stop the dogs from aggroing to you so you can have a 1v1 with Esgar. Now run through the rest of Langdell to Godfrey. And this is the first little hurdle on this build. The fact that I had decided to try out the Mimic Mask, which is literally the worst headpiece in the game for this fight on this build, didn't help. But Godfrey is immune to all status effects. So this is just a standard Godfrey dagger fight. As I've said before, this is actually one of my favourite fights in the game for any build with a fast weapon. It's so satisfying when you get it down. Now before Morgoth, head to Caria Manor in Leonia and up to Bully Loretta. Speak to Rani and then back to the Knight's Sacred Ground to grab the Finger Slayer Blade. Back to Rani for the statue, then go next door to Renner's Rise and take the teleporter to Ainsel River. Run through Noxtella all the way to the Lake of Rot. We're here for some fashion, so make a mark in your map in roughly this spot. Before we go there, Go grab the grace in the Grand Cloister, as it's a little closer. Double back on yourself, and run out to the right. Now the item we want is on top of this structure, but we have to rush as we are on a time limit because of the rot build-up, so we can't afford to make any mistakes. Like grabbing the wrong item. Or failing this really simple jump. Once you're on top of the building, Jump down onto this pillar for the Mushroom Crown. Perfect. Strong look. Now head to Lanedell for Morgoth. If you quit out when you originally enter, you can run back in and use his slow walk to cast Dragon Ice for a Frost proc early on. Get rid of his phase 1 with quick attacks then cast Dragon Ice again during the transition. Then you can use those long cooldowns from the blood attacks for more attacks and status procs. Now 
Now don't level up yet and head up to the mountain tops. And obviously, because we are chopping around with 120k and Miyazaki knows it, enemies that we've never even seen before are going to try and meme us. When you get to the Zamor ruins, ride through them and down into this cellar for the Smithing Bell 3. Then across the bridge and all the way up to the freezing Lake Grace. Drop down the ledge to the south of it and wake the big guy up from his nap and bait him into attacking this statue for some smithing stone sixes. Then ride around the lake to the first church of Marica for some more smithing sixes. Now equip the Dagger Talisman. If you're using the Lord of Blood's Talisman, replace the Wing Sword Talisman with this. And head to Castle Soul for Commander Nile. Open up the fight with Argyle's Flame. I used Dragon Ice because I'm an idiot, but it still wasn't bad in fairness. Then kill the Knights with either parries or backstabs. For Nile, Get one parry riposte in at the start to trigger the big tornado. Dodge the attack, then cast Poison Mist. Then just spam R1s for Rot and Bleed. You can do about half his health from dodging that one single attack. Now for the rest of the fight, there is a perfectly safe strat with a quick weapon if Narl scares you. Keep your distance and bait the little tornado attack. Dodge it, one R1, then two rolls backwards. You can do this for the rest of the fight if you like. Now walk back to the Boar Prawn Shack and south into the village of the Albanurix for the second half of the secret medallion. Now head to the rolled lift to use it. Ride through the snowfields, all the way to Ordner Town. Once again, I'm using Ordner Skip to bypass the puzzle. Jump up on this pillar, line up your compass to the right of this notch, and do two jumps with the direction order being 12 o'clock, 7 o'clock. Run through the Halig Tree to completely bully Loretta. Ah. Yeah, maybe not quite bully. But this one isn't as bad as you might think with a plus 20 weapon at a relatively low level. Use her starting attack to cast Poison Mist, then go for parries and R1s to get those Rot, Bleed and Poison procs. Then you can just use the openings from the big blue combos for more Bleed procs. Now the reason we've done Nile and Loretta so early is that I wanted to grab the Dragon Crest Great Shield Talisman. I used this on my last playthrough on New Game Plus and wanted to see what it was like on New Game. And in short, it's pretty awesome. Head through the rest of the dungeon and light the grace by Melania for later. Now back to the mountaintops for Fire Giant. And this build absolutely trivialises this fight. R1's on the foot for phase one. For phase two, R1's on the hand and then run to the legs for more until you get a bleed proc. From there, stay in front of him, hitting the hands when you can, and wait for him to drop the people's elbow to finish the fight. Head 
head through Farum all the way to the Dragon Temple Transept Grace. Head in and put the duo to sleep. All you have to do now is spam R1s to proc. Ah. Okay, so welcome to the biggest hurdle in this whole run. Sleep cheese doesn't really work for this weapon, so we're going to have to fight them straight up. Happily, it's not a bad build for them at all, but as always, you will be instantly punished if you're too greedy in this fight. My strat here was to attack only Noble as usual, going for R1s between these attacks when no status was applied, then going for the safer parries as soon as I got rot and poison procced. Whenever the big man starts rolling, stand the other side of the pillar and cast Poison Mist. The Lord of Blood's exaltation would make this fight a lot easier, so definitely equip that if you struggle here. Run through the rest of the dungeon to the Beside the Great Bridge Grace. Now, usually this guy is a bit of a nightmare, but on this build, it was one of the easiest fights on the run. Now for Clergyman and Malaketh. As always, any fast weapon is great for Beast, allowing you to play super aggressively and get right up in his face if you know the moveset. If you want to go for a safer approach, go for jumping attacks to punish all of his combos instead. Strategy wise, Malaketh is the same as so many other builds. Just take your time and punish that slow 1-2 combo. Before we head up to Gideon, head back to the Grand Cloister Grace and into Astor. And a combination of particularly rough RNG and me playing like an absolute idiot meant that I got hit by just about every attack he threw in this fight and still managed to beat him. So this build is clearly great for this one. Now for Gideon, and despite this not being a build that we can kill him in his speech with, having time to get those few extra attacks in at the start means that all of our effects are applied by the time that the fight starts. From there, you can just chase him down for that last bit of health for a very easy <laughs> Fuck. You thought well until now.
So as usual, this fight took me, without exaggeration, more time than the rest of the game did. And not an ounce of fun was had at any point during it. In the end, I got so fed up with him that I waited for Prox and then just ran away and hid and waited for the rot to do its thing. And this was a good lesson for the mistake that I made in the first fight. Being far too greedy and trying to steamroll him and be flashy. If we look at this first fight again, at this point, he's already dead. So if I'd have just walked away, I could have saved myself some misery. If you hate this guy as much as I do, that's the play. Oh, and make a save file just before the fight, just in case. Now for Godfrey, and this is such a fun one. The Godfrey fight is no different than any other build. Sneaking in quick attacks between his combos, but here we have the poison and rot build up to help us along. The first half of the Horalu fight is pretty standard as well, punishing those long attack cooldowns with R1s. But as soon as you get your rot and poison proc, you can actually just stop attacking and keep your distance if you want. He's already dead. Now for Radagon. I opened up with Argyle's Flame and then went with a parry strategy. As I showed in my guide, a parry strat here allows for two R1s between each parry and two more after a riposte, meaning that each chain gives you seven attacks. This is a quick and efficient way of applying rot to him. Now, let me tell you about something that goes on behind the scenes when I'm making my guides. On any run where I'm not certain of who the major hurdles are going to be, I'll quite often fight each of the late game bosses as soon as I can to get an idea of what the best order for them will be. Like earlier in this run, when I fought Melania at level 90 with a plus 20 weapon. And this is where her health was four minutes into that fight. And I was pretty sure that what was about to happen would never make it into this video, as right from the start of this run, I thought this guy was going to be the biggest problem in it by far. But, much to my surprise and delight, this was an easy first try. It's really not that bad at all. If you tried my parry build, or have killed Elden Beast with something like a Reduvia, I'd say this is very similar. We certainly can't bully him, but by just spamming R1s between attacks, we do really solid damage throughout the fight. And because we've leveled up enough endurance to light roll with this setup, the worst part of the fight, Elden Stars, is easy to deal with. Now walk back to Ordner Town and ride southwest. Jump onto this ledge to cheese the invader, then take the teleporter to Mogwin's Palace for Moog. I went straight into this one without the purifying tear, getting a frost breath off at the start, then going for our ones. Moog's bleed weakness really trivializes this one as long as you're relatively comfortable with his moveset. I recommend using the purifying tier if you find phase 2 scary, 
as getting attacks in through knee heal will allow you to deal with less of phase 2. The Lord of Blood's exaltation would be fabulous here too. Now back to Farum for Plassey. Not much to say about this one. It's a standard Plassey fight, but all our procs will make that massive health bar disappear a lot quicker than usual. Now head to the Karian study hall and all the way up to the top to grab the curse mark of death. Then down into Nokron and into the aqueducts for the Gargs. And if you're confused about why I killed Placidusax, Moog, and Elden Beast all before the Gargoyles, it's because this fight is probably harder than all of the above. To be honest, I'd have probably fought Melania before them if I didn't like ending my videos with demigod fights. They are completely resistant to all of our status effects. So despite our end game level, damage wise, this fight feels like we're much, much earlier in the game. As always, take your time and don't get too greedy. Our end game health, the Dragon Crest Talisman and the Light Rolls all make this relatively forgiving. Now into Deep Root for the champs. Nothing much to say about this one. We do amazing damage, so these guys really aren't a problem. For Fortisax, this is another fight that is utterly trivialized by all of our status effects. Just spam R1 on the foot. Three or four decent attack windows is all you need. Finally, for Melania. For this one, I went with my standard parry strategy, casting Poison Mist on her recoveries after every jump attack in Phase 1. This was also the point where I went down and finally grabbed the Lord of Blood's Exaltation from Langdell. I did a few attempts without it and was quite close to beating her, but after grabbing it, I got her on the first try. The increased damage from the two Exaltation Talismans really does deliver amazing results, so I'll definitely be trying this out on a future build. And that's it, how to beat Elden Ring by relying on status effects. If you've made it this far, tried this build, or have any suggestions for future builds, please let me know in the comments. If you've enjoyed this video, give it a like and subscribe to my channel for more Elden Ring build guides. As always, thanks for watching. See you soon.